Hello and welcome to the Art of Communication podcast with me, Robin Kermode. For more information on my online public speaking masterclass, visit robinkermode.com. Today on the Communication Expert series, we have world-renowned art expert Philip Mould, OBE. His TV show, Fake or Fortune, is seen all over the globe. It's the UK's most watched arts programme and is now a huge hit in the States. He's also, of course, a very fine writer and popular keynote speaker. So, Philip, obviously we're going to be talking today about communication, but I wondered if I could start by asking you, what was it about art that first spoke to you? I've always been drawn to the visual in fact, I'd go further still. I would say probably the visual is one of those areas I feel comfortable in, and there are many, many areas uh, where I fall short, including music and, and literature. I like poetry. I like poetry, and I actually rather like the linking imagery with art, but, but that's, that's another subject, really. I think my first experiences of art was storybooks, flipping the pages of hand-me-down storybooks, things from my grandparents and parents. Orlando the cat. I remember his orangeness all over the place. And I think it was probably that that gave me an attachment to the visual. A bit like a jackdaw, any of the Corvid family, actually. I'm drawn to things that glisten. So when members of the public on the Antiques Roadshow, for example, bring in things that glisten to them, as it were, they're presumably quite nervous because they haven't been on TV before and you've been doing it for many years. I wonder if part of your job as a communicator, a presenter and an expert is to put them at their ease. The better the person you're speaking to, your friend slash contributor, the better you can do your programme. Mm. And so you do it partly out of compassion because mm. sometimes people do get very nervous. And mm. I remember being terribly nervous when I first did television. I mean sort of rigidly so. But you also do it to get some sort of harmonious flow. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting, and something I've learnt doing television, we've done about 23 fake or fortunes with contributors, and that is even with the best edits, a flowing conversation cannot be beaten. Because the au naturel going back and forth, you know, of you and I just talking now over mm -hmm. this table smelling this bunch of lilacs next to me, that, that there is a sort of actuality quality to it. Mm -hmm. That if it was edited like this, and I had it's just too, done it, it, just, it, it, you can always do it, you can smell, you can yes, sniff you can. and edit. Um, even if it's done seamlessly. Mm -hmm. And basically people don't talk succinctly either. So I'm always suspicious if someone puts something beautifully in 25 <laughs> words. You talk about your first time on television there. For a lot of people that I work with, obviously nerves are an important hurdle for them to face. This isn't just people starting out. The more senior you become, the more nerves kick in because you're in the firing line, as it were. So when you're filming Fake or Fortune that has a worldwide audience of many millions, how do you deal with your nerves? I hate nerves, and I used to recall when I was... That's, there's ice creams, incidentally. It's brilliant, isn't it? I'm so pleased we're in the countryside. One thing we're always taught, by the way, with the extraneous sounds is to make reference to them because mm -hmm. otherwise the listener doesn't quite know. It's the same as being on stage <laughs> because if you're on stage and there's a bang outside, it's much better to refer to it and it sounds like it might have been intended. <laughs> it's, it's, I know, I know. I have memories of being very nervous. When I first really did serious television, I did a series for Channel 4 in my 20s and I was so nervous that I could see myself from above, you know, with that feeling of... In the out-of-body experience. Oh, my kind of thing. God, it was terrible. And I was fine in the rehearsals, but I had to memorise so many lines. And I think I was on the cusp of sort of old-fashioned television where you had to be rather sort of pedagogic mm -hmm. and you had to basically do a, a miniature lecture. In fact, it's what's very interesting is if you look at some of these early art documentaries, or look at Kenneth Clark as Civilization. Mm -hmm. You know, he's Mandarin. Mm -hmm. You know, he sits there, you know, in front of the Colosseum for about sort of two minutes, three minutes. Yes. He I gives have, you a talk. I have the answers and I will tell you. Yeah, it's a lecture. Yes. But modern television, I think modern communication is increasingly not that. So nerves is something that I hate. Will People you? say it's good for you. Will Doing you? more and more, I've managed to diminish the spectre because it does feel like a spectre. And what is lovely... And people used to say, you must look forward to being old because all sorts of things will happen. 
Well, now that I've sort of hit the yard arm of 60, I really do think I'm a lot more relaxed in almost everything I do. And television and broadcasting is something that, that now comes naturally to well, me. Why is it, do you think, is it we care less? What is it? Is it just mm. experience, maybe? I mean, I think vanity diminishes because you realise that you can't be vain anymore. You're very true. It's also experience, of course, like the 10,000 hours theory. When you've done something enough, you relax in the knowledge that you know what you're doing. So, Philip, when you're standing up there in front of an audience, do you think it's important to grab them right at the start? I always think that if you don't grab the listener or you don't get the viewer early on, you've basically had it. But I think, and this is my sort of ideology these days, the own natural approach is you don't actually have to be that head-turning immediately. I think you can slow burn your way into things rather more. And it's probably to do with conviction, and it's probably to do with the, with the experience of age, mm-hmm. and perhaps you impart that. I mean, nothing, nothing works better than confidence. Mm-hmm. And I think we're all terribly clever at outing false confidence. So I suppose what I'm saying is, is rather bleak from a, from a learning point of view, but it's rather exciting from the perspective of have something to look forward to. Yes, absolutely. You know, because the more you do it, uh, the better it is. What I will say is I always prepare, and if I am doing a talk, I give the talk to myself as I walk across the park. I'm very aware that my throwaway comments, my spontaneous remarks are best rehearsed. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because there's, there's nothing worse than coming away thinking, I wish I'd said that. <laughs> and much better to have a few things up your sleeve. Mm. Maybe you have five things up your sleeve and you only ever say two of them, but it's better to have a, a yes, little bit more Yes, definitely. There, a it? little armoury. I remember re- reading a book when I was young on how to make a good speech. My father's a very good speech giver and writer. He gave me a little book on making speeches. In the introductory chapter, and I always remember this, it said you should always carry your speech with you. Have it in your top pocket. You never know when you might need it. And this is a sort of generic speech. Yes, I It's like. a sort of three or four paragraphs with a joke and something meaningful, which you can adapt to anything from a thank you letter to dealing with a traffic ward. <laughs> You're absolutely right. When I was younger, I used to watch people who could stand up and say a few words. And I was always yeah. in awe of these people who did that. And then I realised yeah. as I get older that actually they do have a bit of a generic speech. Yeah. They adapt it slightly, they but do. they kind of have two or three jokes and mm. stories that they know work and they bring mm. those out. And I think having those in your armoury is, is helpful. I think politicians are an extremely good example. I mean, have you ever asked a politician to give a speech or say a few appropriate words who's refused? <laughs> no. And, and it never happens, <laughs> never. does it? It doesn't. You're absolutely right. And apparently Bill Clinton, who could be quite sort of maudlin, apparently, and uh, rather introspective and uh, disconcerting to those who were introducing him, as soon as he was there, as soon as he felt the warmth of humanity, mm. off he went. So he turned from a rather sort of alarmingly dried-out husk into some sort of forward-going mellifluous figure. What, what I heard he also does is he's very good at talking to some members of the audience beforehand so that he mm. can very much appear to be a sort of man of the people. So he'll be mm. introduced, he'll stand up there and he'll say, do you know, he said, I was, uh, I was talking to Bob earlier. Where, where's Bob? Uh, hello, Bob. Bob and I were having a nice conversation. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it may well be that Bob doesn't exist at all. We don't yes. know this, do we? Because yes. there's 500 no, sure. people in the audience. Nobody's going sure. to go, is there actually a Bob here? The point is, he probably was talking to somebody, but it makes it spontaneous and it stops it sounding yeah, yeah, like yeah, the sure, rehearsed speech. Sure. And actually, it's a very interesting point. Uh, my father, who really was a, a very, a very great speaker, I think. He's still in his no, 90s and actually he's... He's got a sense of humour and a great turn of phrase. Still, he gave me some very good advice once based on his own experience, which was he was in Liverpool and he was chairman of a thing called Merseyside Council for Voluntary Services. And it was a tough gig. And he was speaking at one particular event and he knew that there were three very turbulent fathers in the trade union movement. And he knew that whatever he said, they were going to go for him. So he found out their names and he began the talk by saying, I just want to say how grateful I am that Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith yeah. and Mr. Bloggs is here. Because, frankly, to make a talk like this without them being present would be to make no talk at all. Exactly. And then he had them, he had them in their hand so thereafter. Keep your enemies you know, close. You know, keep like, your enemies exactly, close. Exactly. Yeah. Very, very yeah. good. Yeah. Now, Philip, I've seen you give talks at history festivals and art festivals and things mm. like this. Is there a difference between being on television where you're essentially you're talking to maybe your co-host or the viewer who isn't there, and standing up in front of, say, 500 or 1,000 people. Is there a Mm. difference in terms of how you feel? Yes, 
so television is all about hitting a particular point, finding a way of coming in, coming out, talking to somebody else very often at the same time. You know, in Fake Up Fortune, I'm maybe chatting to Fiona, Bruce, who I do it with, or one of the contributors. And you're keeping a number of balls in your head. You're, you're trying to stand on the spot or hit the spot. You know, there's quite a lot of contrivance. What is rather lovely about a talk is that those type of confines fall away. And I go into what I think probably could be described as bedtime story mode. Right. So you have more freedom, essentially. Well, you, you go where you want to go. You do. And, and what is lovely is holding people's attention through story. And as soon as I start by saying, well, there was a particular occasion when I encountered somebody who... And then at that point, you could hear the slight hush. Yes. When you're giving a talk and you're standing on a platform like that, you've got maybe 500 people in front of you, can you sense whether you have them? In other words, whether they're with you? And can you sense mm. if you've lost them? Definitely you can. And you can hear the silence when you've got them mm. and you don't notice twitching. It's intoxicating, that silence, isn't it? Yes, when, it is, it, when it, you it, know you've got that. Yes, yes, yes it yeah. is. And I'll tell you where I didn't get it, and it was a small disaster, was doing the morning assembly at Eton College, doing a little talk on Van Dyke. And the boys all poured in and then... An empty auditorium was suddenly full of scratching, sniffing, disgruntled-looking teenagers. <laughs> Within about 20 seconds, you forget teenagers at school. Teenagers are a hard audience. Well, They're they are, but audience. you remember, remember the bell, the movement of the bell, the doors open, then there's this great clattering, thunderous arrival of, of a tide of people. And so I was suddenly confronted by all of that. And I began, you know, Van Dyke was born in 15-whatever mm. and died in such and such. And I realised I had not a hope of keeping them interested. So what I did was I suddenly realised that the way to get a, a room of 15 or 16-year-olds was to talk about money. And I said, you know, if you found this picture in a junk shop, you might have picked it up for two or three hundred quid. However, this is by the great master Van Dyke, someone who could transform faces. There are people across the world who would love to own this. And would probably pay you up to a million quid. And then I got that moment of silence. Mm. And it was not something in an art history lecture I would ever have dreamt of doing. So when you're on Fake of Fortune, somebody turns up with a painting and you go along mm. to see them. Mm. And you know in your heart that this is not what they think it is. Mm. When do you tell them that? <laughs> Do you put yourself in their shoes and say, well, let's go and have a look and investigate it? Whereas inside your head you go, it's not a Rubens, it's not yes. a Rembrandt. It's one of the greatest challenges, actually, is managing expectations. Certainly you learn that doing the Antiques Roadshow, where you're doing seven or eight records a day. You have to keep a level of expectation going, otherwise the viewer will lose interest. Yeah. It's a bit like a murder mystery, isn't it? Did the yes, butler do it, it or not, right yeah. the way through to the end? Yes, yes it is. I never tell anybody that their object is worthless at the end, because that is so cruel. But of course it's not worthless. Well, nothing's worth no. The air we breathe is not worthless. Mm. I also try and find some aspect of the painting or something that one can be positive about. When I tell them it's worth very little, I might say it's one less responsibility in your life. And you find a way of giving rather yeah, than Yes, so you taking. say, well, just enjoy it for what it is. <laughs> yes, and exactly. love it and have it exactly. on the wall. Don't exactly. feel you have to have it in a bank vault. So, so true. Uh, another area of your life I wanted to talk about is as an art dealer. So as an art dealer, you're having to try mm. to infuse your potential customers about mm. a particular painting. There's a level of salesmanship around that, I suppose. But there's also a level of imparting passion and enthusiasm. Of course, passion and enthusiasm is a large part of it. And if you have bought the painting in the first place, you've gone through this whole process of, of consummation. You know, you have been there. You yourself have decided that this thing is worth buying, cleaning, restoring, researching, framing. You know, it's, it's almost part of you by the end. So that when you do speak about it, you can speak about it with the authority of something that is almost an expression of you, and, th and that's very, very helpful. I think passion is a wonderful thing when it grows internally out of you. Mm -hmm. But passion, when it's applied too liberally, is like an overly plastered wall. It doesn't hang up. But equally, I think one can be a little bit sort of dry and maudlin on occasions. Mm -hmm. One needs that variety. You want to, to vary it. I think that 
there are people I know who are passionate about everything. And the trouble is that if everything has passion, then in a sense, nothing has passion. If everything mm. is happy, then yes. nothing is yeah. happy because, of course, life is a mixture of happiness and yeah. sadness. So I think that it is about variety. And I would imagine that one of the challenges you have doing an art programme is how do you make what's considered art, as it were, as in not mainstream, how do you talk to everyday people about something that may be considered rather erudite? Art, in many ways, is an illusion. It's a trick. You know, it's someone with technical brilliance who, in the case of traditional art, can turn a three-dimensional scene into a two-dimensional one and then, with a poetic dimension, can elevate it into something worthwhile or enduring. I think the more you can deconstruct the trick, you know, rather like talking about wine or music or what have you, I've found that probably the best way to talk about art is provenance, the history of it, how people have perceived it, the materials and how they're used. And then in a very literal way, you know, I, I think what you have to do is you have to talk in terms of the sort of prosaic nature in which things happen and are made rather than this is an outstanding example of a late 17th century picture, right. and just look at the capacity the artist has got yes, to attach the your already. emotions. Yeah, yes. But if you just say, that is an incredible highlight in that eye. You know, mm. Look at the thickness of it, and imagine how dull that face would be without the light catching those features. Mm. For me, it's always the specifics that make something interesting, isn't it? So mm. you, sp you bring something out, and, ah, oh, wow... One thing that interests me with the way people communicate, obviously with their voice if they're giving speeches, but is how musicians through their music and artists through their art have a voice. Can you always tell the voice of an artist? Can you feel or see the voice of an artist in the painting? It's rather like the, the handwriting of a friend on the envelope. You don't need to open the envelope to know it's from them. Take someone like Thomas Gainsborough, for example. I mean, one of the reasons that he was so great a crystallizer of 18th century romance and, and landscape and humanity was his chameleon skills at being able to respond to people. And just when you think you've absolutely cracked it, you've got the DNA of that artist, you'll come across something he did when he was... And he started painting, believe it or not, at the age of sort of eight or nine, you know, from his teenage years... And it will completely throw you in the same way that Shakespeare might surprise you. Whatever that magic is that you feel about it, somehow you transmit that. And as you say, if you're too enthusiastic, yes. it can look a bit sales-ish and a bit false sometimes. And that's right. What is always worth asking, and, and this is something I think I've learned through giving many, many talks, and that is why do you go to a talk rather than just listen to someone on television or the radio or what have you? I mean, what is it? It's the frisson of seeing the human being standing up in front of you talking. But try and pare that down or analyse that. Mm -hmm. What is it you're, you're looking for? Well, you want the warmth and the reality of someone who you might have heard about. You want to actually engage with them in, in a room. That's on, on one level. But also, you want them to be natural. You want to be able to see a side of them that you don't normally get in the purified essence, which has created their reputation. If I've learned anything about communication and giving talks, it is as far as possible, be yourself. Mm, I think that's absolutely the key. And show your hesitations. Show your shabbinesses. Mm. And, and when things go yeah. wrong, it's absolutely fine. People like it, actually. And, and Funny enough, in, in the audience, as, a, as an actor, if you're on stage and things go wrong, the audiences love it. Because, of course, they go, I was there the night when that, that mm, person did that. Mm, Rather than mm, thinking, what a mm, fool. What a fool to have sure, forgotten his lines. Sure. So there's something about the liveness, I think. And we're not being sold to in the same way, which is what we are very often with a wrapped up purified essence. And the most successful talk I ever did was the Norfolk Churches Trust, which was about 15 years ago. And the projector that they gave me, because in those days we had projectors, mm. 20 years ago, actually, you're talking about now, it was something from the church hall. Was that like a carousel projector? It was, it was a carousel, but the projector itself had this long aluminium tube out of which the pictures sort of somehow came at the yes. end. It looked, actually, it was a rather nice piece of retro Second World Wars design. Yes. And every time I popped in a slide, and I think the subject was Rubens, it would go up in smoke. But I would have normally about 30 seconds before it went up in smoke. And the whole room that would normally be asleep was on the edge of their chairs waiting to find out when this image would just bubble and disappear in front of me. A talk that should have taken 45 minutes, I rattled through about 23 minutes. 
but the, the round of applause at the end, I can still feel it in the air. Absolutely fabulous. So that's a, a real example of live humanity and authenticity, staying in the moment and really connecting with your audience. Mm. Philip, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for being our communication expert on the Art of Communication podcast today. And keep on telling us how to do it, Robin. Thank you very much, Robin. Take care. For more information on my online public speaking masterclass, visit robinkermode.com.